Good morning, one and all. Uh, welcome to another Mr. Businessman. Uh, I'm going to keep an eye on the um, stutteriness of this. I've just been watching the... Um, I've got like a numbers thing here that tells me, you know, like how good the stream is and it's been a bit up and down. So um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on it anyway. I hope I'm not stuttering. If I do, um, I'll just cancel the whole thing. Um, <laughs> we're going to keep it quite tight today because there isn't there isn't that many uh, many things to talk about. There's a bigger discussion to be had, but uh, I just want to get you the basics down, really, of what um, f the five forces are and, and sort of get them into your head uh, a little bit. All right, so we're going to jump straight into it. Um, I've got another video that I'm going to put up uh, after this, um, just, just a, literally a 10-second one, just about different subject. All right, so we're going to jump straight in um, and let's get to it. Okay, so um, yeah, we're going to do about five forces today, Porter's five forces, um, really interesting bit of theory, um, it basically dictates, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about it in, in, in the use of a specific business, but what the five forces model actually talks about is it talks about how attractive new markets are to a company, so when you're looking to go into a new market, um, it tells you how attractive that is. And it, and the way it tells you that is it breaks it down into five different things. And the amount of force, if you will, um, or the power of those forces, the five different aspects um, that would um, affect your business. So the bigger the force it has on you, um, the less attractive that it will be to your business to go into that. The more um, power you might have on that, um, the more positive it will be, and the more power, uh, you know, the more attractive it will be to get your company to go into that market to actually look at the potential of that. So let's have a little look at it. So first of all, so it says, why can Tesco? Let's ask a couple of questions. It says, why can Tesco achieve cheaper prices from its supplier than a small um, retailer? Okay, so you talk about economies of scale, don't you? We know that the, the bigger companies, we know that more powerful companies. But what is it about Tesco's, the company, um, that actually makes them more powerful? What is it about the power? Well, a couple of things, isn't it? The the buying power, so physical power in terms of the, the uh, ability to buy. Um, they can put pressure on you, can't they? So we call that buyer power. Um, so then them as a buyer, you know, let's say we, we know, don't we, that they had a real problem with the, um, the milk, but like dairy farmers have been having a real problem with places like Tesco and other companies like supermarkets and stuff. And, and the reason that, um, that they've been having a problem is because, um, the supermarkets are demanding certain prices and, uh, you, you might say, well, just don't, don't sell to them then if you can't afford to sell to them. But the problem is that they're buying in such bulk and they are such powerful players in that industry that there isn't going to be another customer to come and buy, you know, buy millions of, of litres of, of milk from you. So if you decide to get rid of this, this customer, if you decide to play a hardball, if you decide to not play with them, um, then you will come off worse than having to deal with them. So they're, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, really. If you if you sell to them, you're going to make a loss. Uh, if you don't sell to them, you're going to go under. So it's a really difficult one. That uh, they they really do exploit it. These companies um, to to the to, to the betterment of them, and, and and rightfully so to an extent. I mean, remember, it's not. Um, although we talk about stakeholders and things like that, it's it's hard to. Uh, blame Tesco's for being as competitive and as dominant as they are when they've earned that spot. I suppose you could talk about, you know, the, um, you know, the, the sort of um, morality and the ethics of it, but that's not what we're talking about, really, is it? So why would it be difficult to start up a new airline, and why is this good for existing airlines? Well, it's the the big thing for this one is barriers to entry, isn't it? So for this one, uh, if you were, you know, for, for the physical cost of actually creating an airline is obscene, isn't it? If you want to have another look, um, I'll try and put it in the description if I remember. But um, the um, Virgin, when Virgin um, decided to go into Virgin Atlantic, um, we watched it in class where we had. Um, where they started as the music music store and then they, they went into Virgin Atlantic, got the planes and everything. Uh, and it nearly bankrupted Virgin. You know, they, they were a very successful company, but um, it was extremely difficult for Virgin to get into um, the the transatlantic, you know, flights 
um, and and air, airliner uh, industry in general because uh, it was so different. Um, the the start of costs are just crazy. You're buying planes. You're having to buy space at the airport to actually physically land. I mean, that's a bit of a con as well, isn't it? That they actually they actually um, rent space, you know, for your for your plane at hand, uh, you know, Stansted Airport or whatever it is, Heathrow. Um, whereas you'd think that it wouldn't work like that you know you wouldn't th- you'd think that they just sort of go where there's a space but it, but it doesn't work like that they do rent it um so it's good for existing airlines though isn't it because once you get into that once you become dominant then people can't really take you on um because it's so difficult to get into after they don't know anything about it uh, what problems can increase levels of competition bring to a firm well the more in- the you know we know that the more um the more competition it is the more literally the more competition there will be (laughs) so um it's going to be more difficult to uh compete there's going to be this added pressure of pricing isn't there there's going to be people trying to undercut you there's going to be people who are trying to draw attention to the faults of the company and things like that things which you'd never have usually had um if you're in a little niche market or something like that and there's not been that much competition you can kind of get away with doing stuff anything you want can't you there's the problem with having monopolies um if you have a monopoly then uh, you can basically do whatever you want can't you and that's that's the reason that increased levels of competition are a benefit to the consumer because we want there to be competition we want there to be pressure put on these companies but the companies don't want that do they they'd ideally like it to just be them and it says why is a firm in a business so uh, why is a firm in a business to business transaction likely to be able to negotiate its own prices a lot of that will to will be to do with the amount that you're spending the relationship that you have your brand who you are specifically so the likelihood of you being able to do that uh, but if we take it to really really basic stuff in comparison to say business to consumer so me going into a store why can't i go and negotiate my own prices um well because i'm just buying one thing aren't i um so they will treat me as you know a very well they're not going to treat me as a particularly important customer whereas if i'm going to go and buy if i buy one iphone then you know i'm just anyone if i buy ten thousand iphones i'm a little bit more important if i buy 10 million iphones I'm a little bit more important now, aren't I? So it just depends on what you specifically are doing. I'm not saying that you can't do it. You know, if you go onto a car boot sale or something, business to consumer, yeah. Um, I say business to consumer. It's more consumer to consumer, that one, isn't it? But if we took it like that, small things like that, small shops. I've heckled. It's heckled. Um, I've negotiated in shops before, um, bartered. Uh, I remember once I went to um, Scotland, top of Scotland, um it was, it's called John O'Groats, it's literally the top end of Scotland, it's as far as you can go, um, and I went into a shop there, and they had this um, big um, Maku, sort of like, you know, the big ginger uh, cows uh, that they have in Scotland, um, and they had this massive big one that I wanted, uh, wanted, and it was like 100 quid or something, um, but I was going to buy some smaller ones uh, at the same time as presents for people, um, so I said to them, well, what if I buy this, can I have a discount on this if I if I get these, and they did. So uh, it's downstairs, actually, that uh, that Maku right now. Um, <laughs> so um, this is what the five forces actually looks like. So let's we're going to go through them one by one, um, and then we'll, we'll pull them apart a bit, but it's not going to take crazy amounts of time. So it says, Porter proposed a model of the business environment that pictured industries and firms as being influenced as, uh, with or rather by five forces. These forces will determine the likely profitability of an industry. So... We talk about the it's the attractiveness um, of that industry, so the profitability the, um, of whether you should go into it really, and these will dictate the how attractive they are, how likely you are to succeed in that industry, and therefore you know why we should do it or why we shouldn't do it. Um, so first of all, we've got our barriers to entry right at the start. We talked about this. So factors that prevent new competition entering the market. Now with barriers to entry, it doesn't have to be physical barriers to entry. It could be things like. Um, having a patent or a copyright or um, a really good business relationship or um, loyalty from your customers or a brand image or um, a uniqueness of something. So, you know, don't think that you have to have something specifically physical to stop people entering a market because it's just not true. Uh, you can have, um, you know, if you wanted to go into a market now making shoes, I'm not saying someone like Under Armour have done really well. I'm surprised how well they've done, you know, to come out that. But I, I don't know much about that company other than they, they seem to have done really well. But I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised if they have a, a big connection to um, other companies. I mean, in fact, let's let's have a look now. I'll, I'll just, I've got my, um, 
I've got my thing here, just one second. Um, show you behind the scenes here. Under armor, not under active thyroid. No. Under armor, let's have a quick look at this. I'd be surprised if they didn't have any connection to anything. American company manufactures footwear. Nineteen ninety six. Ah, right. So it, this is an interesting one. So it says here, Under Armour received its first big break in nineteen ninety nine when Warner Brothers contracted Under Armour to outfit two of its feature films, Oliver Stone's Any Given Sundays and The Replacements. Uh, Jamie Foxx wears an Under Armour jock strap, uh, leveraging the release of any given Sunday. Plank released an ad in the ESPN magazine. The ad generated close to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of sales, and then they became the outfitter of the XFL Football League. Um. So uh, right, it, I mean, <laughs> it isn't really a case in point to be honest, because I thought the uh, my point really was the the fact that. Uh, Usually, they wouldn't bother going into an industry like that when there was such domination by people like uh, Adidas and Nike and things like that. But it shows, isn't it? Good case in point that uh, it shows it can be done in that regard. Sometimes it's not that it can't have been a particularly attractive one, but it did say that uh, the guy who made Under Armour, the original, the, the owner, um, wasn't getting what he wanted from those products. So that means that he, he, you know. Necessity is the mother of invention, isn't it? So he knew that there was a market for these. There must have been a market for it because he himself was the market for something. Um, so yeah, I mean, if I was if I was work, you know, if I was looking into a market now to go into, I wouldn't be going into you know sports, um, leisure sort of stuff or you know like um, shoes and things like that because you'd be going up against people like Nike, wouldn't you? Um, it wouldn't be particularly. Uh, demonstrably um, attractive proposition because of how dominant those other people are, uh, and the competition, you know, like the the connection that they've got to the industry, and and you know how encroached they are in that thing. Um, so it says factors that you know. Next one we got buyer power. So what is buyer power? Well, buyer power is how powerful the buyers are in that industry or that market. Okay, so. Do buyers tend to be your Tesco's buying thousands and thousands of products or do they tend to be uh, individuals buying one-off products? Do they tend to be loyal um, or you need to be developing that relationship? Remember relationship marketing or do they tend to be one-off people who don't really have to stay with you? Um, if they are loyal people, then the biopower is going to be quite significant, isn't it? Because you need them to come back. It's quite a niche market. If it's something that's quite dealing with like fad stuff and you, you only have to buy them once, you know, fidget spinners or something, there wouldn't be any necessity. It's not really a high biopower at that point because loads of people wanted them. Um, and it didn't really matter. You only had to sell them once. And if you did, if they didn't, if they weren't very good quality or anything, it wasn't like they were coming back to buy them again, was it? So it says... The power of customers to determine prices. It didn't really matter to you. You're not going to haggle about it, you know, at the time. But if you were to go and try and buy a, a fidget spinner today, then I'd say your buyer power would be through the roof because no one wants buyer, uh, no one wants fidget spinners. So if you could, you know, like, so if the if if people had a load of stock of them, um, then that would be, you know, that would put you in the power position, wouldn't it? That would allow you to go and buy them up essentially if you wanted because no one else wants them anymore. Um, can you see how it changes? It depends on the time and things like that of, of you know, uh, the buyer power at that time. Then we've got supplier power. So the ability of suppliers to set prices. And this comes down to things like, you know, the ability to actually provide. So what's going on in the economy and things like that. Like I'd say supplier power at the minute for um, PPE, you know, personal protective equipment is absolutely amazing um, because, 
it's not like anybody else can do it. I mean, you've got these people who are, you know, printing stuff at home and things like that, but the vast majority of people, uh, are, they're not, there's not the buyer power. You know, it's not like the NHS are going to say, oh, yeah, well, you know, we, we're going to have to negotiate on price. You can say, no, we'll get stuff there. And I'll tell you what, I'll sell it to America, I'll sell it to France, I'll sell it to, you know, so they would be very, very powerful in that regard. It's not like they're going to really want to do any negotiations with you and things like that. Um, whereas usually, if you were to go to a PP, you know, PP isn't a new thing, personal protective equipment isn't a new thing something that's been thrust into the limelight but usually um the nhs would be an extremely powerful buyer and the supplier power would be quite low because the vast majority of people don't need ppe it's quite for specific markets really isn't it for like um you know fumes and things like that and protecting people uh, when they're doing maybe construction and things like that so there would be an element of it because it's quite and and the more niche the more specific the product the higher the supplier power essentially um because they're the only ones who can do it and if you've got a, um if you've got a uh, what's it called um a a patent or a copyright on it or something like that then that makes you really powerful because if you want to buy a cyclone technology um vacuum cleaner you have to go to dyson there's no way that you can do it um i think as well a lot of it is societal things of, of the expectation on society to do this as well will exp will will dictate buyer and supplier power because uh you know, some people have expectations of you, of what you'll do and whether you have a product and things like that. And that massively dictates it. Next one, substitutes. Um, the, the threat or risk of an alternative product or services. So like I said, this can massively impact it, can't it? And remember, substitutes is alternative products as well. So it's not just a like-for-like -like product. If you don't buy a Dyson, you could buy a Hoover. You know, if you don't buy a Hoover, you could buy a Samsung. Uh, um, vacuum cleaner it doesn't have to be vacuum cleaners though it could be something that which you could use instead um like a brush or something like that um or you have these things where they like sort of soak into your carpet now and you can hoover that up or something like that um so yeah it can be substitutes can be things which are similar to them or you might do them instead of them so instead of buying a laptop you might decide to buy a um you know a tablet pc still a substitute yeah it's not it isn't it's essentially like for like isn't it it's, it's very similar but it's not exactly the same a laptop and a tablet pc are two two completely different things but um they, they essentially do the same thing or you wouldn't have i, mean, I say you wouldn't have both i have i do have both but you know you see what i mean you wouldn't usually you would go into the shop and buy one of them you wouldn't usually buy two of them you would buy either or um, so not only, you know, substitute products for, if we talk about the MacBook, you could have things like the, you know, the Microsoft laptops, you know, you've got things like uh, Lenovo's laptops, um, Microsoft make their own laptops, you've got Apple laptops, you've got, um, who else have you got? Uh, Toshiba and people like that, Sony don't do them anymore, but you used to, um, and uh you know, but instead of those substitute goods as well, for those you could have, you know, a desktop. You could have, um, so physically, you know, having a big computer. You could have, um, a, you know, a um, I suppose smartphones for for a large extent might be the ones that you can plug into your monitors and stuff like that now. And you could also have tablets. Can you see? So yes, okay, Apple does have a lot of substitute products in terms of Microsoft's laptops and things like that. But they've also got tablet PCs and things like that to think about as well, isn't it? How many? different options of people got and then finally you've got competition so how much competition exists in the market is it a really saturated market is there many different people is there a large amount and then we can think about the market structure can't we uh, monopoly oligopoly duopoly uh, monopolistic competition that kind of stuff remember about monopolistic competition that just to draw your attention back to it is it's the differentiated by brand aren't they lots of people say um, get it mixed up and start talking about monopolistic competition as in the word monopoly monopolistic is where you've got lots and lots of different um, companies that are essentially uh, differentiating themselves with brand because they're quite similar products and things like that so have a think about the structure of that market is that you know is it monopolistic is it monopoly is there a lot amount of people is there is there a few amount of people you know that will dictate the ability for you to get into that market and successfully get your stuff together won't it you know if, if i was looking at um you know, we're just just down the road from me. Um, they have uh, it's it's constantly um surrounded by. If there's ever a shop that opens, there's a little like you know a village bit that little um with little shops and stuff. Um, and uh, it's constantly either a takeaway or a hairdressers. It's ridiculous. It's like there's twelve. The, 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 there must be about twelve hairdressers, and there's many uh, uh, takeaways. There's really no need to be opening any more takeaways. If I I wouldn't put a takeaway over there because. 
there's so much competition. It's insane. <laughs> you know, um, I, I'd be thinking maybe you should be thinking about something new. But but I have to say, simultaneously, um, sometimes it is good to put similar products next to each other, don't you? If you know, we have a KFC. If you have a KFC, then you, know, you might be better putting a subway right next to it because then when people get to KFC, they might go, oh, there's a big queue or, oh, actually, I am not don't fancy KFC or I, I prefer this. There's an argument for that, isn't there? Um, okay, so what I'd like you to do is, if you've never used uh, Porter's Five Forces before, I'd, I would like you to have a go at um, doing a bit of revision with it, all right? So just put them out on your page and do them um, about this. So it says, uh, annotate the diagram. So just, if you've not got the diagram, feel free to draw it up. It doesn't take that long, literally. Barriers to entry, buyer power, substitutes, degree and level of competition, um, and supplier power. Um, and, and as well with these, they might be in slightly different places. It's okay. Just, I mean, I find it easier to memorize them like this, but it's up to you. It doesn't matter as long as you remember what the five forces are. You can have them in any way you want. And then just go through and try and think of some examples as well. Because when you're in an exam situation, you might need to bring out your own examples to be able to do your AO4, your evaluation or whatever it is that you're trying to do at that time. You might want to say, well, actually, if you were to compare it to, say, supermarkets where there's a high level of competition, there is um, high... Um, uh, buyer power, low supplier power, you know. Do you see what I mean? Having a couple of different things. Have a think about, you know, people buying maybe fleets of cars versus an individual buying a car. Um, what about people who... Um, might have you know someone who, who shops at macro versus someone who or costco versus someone who shops at spa you know they will have different levels of, of supplier power buyer power won't they in terms of that because if you are a you know a company buying business to business you're going to have more buyer power to an extent it depends on the situation doesn't it no uh, let, let's go through these okay so uh, it says current firms will want barriers to entry to be what because it will be help what so it says current firms will want barriers to entry to be high won't they because they don't want other people coming into there because they will want they will help prevent uh, new comp uh, competition entering the market all right thus the current firms uh, can maintain its dominance over the market or its consumers um with no new firms entering the market the business can have more control over the price it charges and reduce the number um of substitutes for its products and that kind of stuff um Thus, the higher the barriers to entry, the more likely the levels of um, level of profitability. So it says here, uh, factors that determine the barriers to entry for industry are uh, cost advantages to to existing firms. So in terms of can you, you know have you got a good relationship? Do you actually have an advantage over someone who's coming into this market because you already have you know pre pre done um, deals, special deals that no one else is going to get. Uh, access to factories of production it's going to be difficult for you to set up remember we've been talked about we've talked about more services stuff haven't we like supermarkets and that but what if you wanted to physically make things like factories like you're making a car or something like that it's going to be difficult to set up a new car factory isn't it and buy all the capital intensive stuff um government policy so you, it might make it easier might make it more difficult uh depends on what they're trying to do at this moment in time um, you know, especially international trade is a particularly hot topic at the minute, isn't it? And difficult one. Um, remember as well, by the way, at this point in time, um, we've still not got a an EU deal. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the year. You thought coronavirus was bad. Let's wait until that, that all kicks off. Uh, you've got your economies of scale, um, your capital required. So how much money do you actually physically need? Your brand, your access to technology and your access to, uh, your access to distribution networks are very important, aren't they? Very, very vital, especially for some companies more than others. Um, because some, if it was a niche product, you might be able to send it directly from things. The size of the product, the, you know, the ability to maybe for them to collect it, whatever it is that the, you know, you've got to look at the specifics of the situation haven't you uh second one is your buyer power so it says firms will want uh buyer power to be what so they will have more flexibility well they want it to be high uh, don't they they want buyer power no sorry firms will want buyer power to be low they if they themselves were trying to buy they would want it to be high but we call that supplier power don't we so um so firms will want buyer power to be low so that they have more flexibility in terms of the price they can charge without losing customers. Remember, price elasticity of demand comes into this, doesn't it? The bigger the buyer power, the, the more elastic the product will be. So it'll have a massive impact on it, okay? Um, because, remember, there, there would be substitutes or other things that they could go for. Um, 
they're dictating the, the their ability to buy at that point, aren't they? And the lower the buyer power, the more price inelastic the product can potentially be because they have no power. They don't have an ability to go to somewhere else. Thus, the lower the buyer power, the more likely um, they are to the the higher the likely levels of profitability. So we want as a as a consumer, we want our buyer power to be high, so we can we can dictate what we want and have more power over what they do we want the best quality at the lowest price but it, but firms com companies themselves they want our buyer power to be low because they don't want us to be um, able to you know to argue with them they just want to, to go into it don't they uh, factors that determine the level of the buyer power are things like buyer volume like i said are you buying one are you buying 10 million um availability of uh, alternative suppliers um Speaks for itself, doesn't it? Can you go down the road and buy another one? Uh, have they got some kind of patent on something? Is there only a small amount of it? We know, don't we? Um, you know, like Diamond Companies is a brilliant example of this. Um, sort of, it's probably for, more for supplier power. Your availability of alternative supplies. Um, you know, Diamonds uh, are not a an unusual thing, but you've got companies that have bought up all the diamond mines. So that means that, um, and they've made out that diamonds are a really unusual thing. So now um, everyone's got it in their mind that diamonds are a precious stone. And they're not, that, they are a precious stone, but they're nowhere near worth the kind of money that we make them into. And it's because the companies own all the, all the they've, they've got the, the collection of them. They went and bought them up. So it's not like you can just go somewhere else. You know, you have to, if you want a diamond, you have to go to them. That's the problem, isn't it? That's extreme supplier power, that. But um, in terms of this, uh, price sensitivity, so level of elasticity, is it is it naturally a price inelastic or elastic product? Is it a necessity good? Is it an inferior good? What is it? All right. Um, availability of substitutes and things like that. Okay, let's move on to the next one. It says supplier power, like I've been talking about just a second ago. Firms will want the supplier power uh, to be high, so the suppliers will need to maintain... Um, sorry, I, it's because I'm, I, I'm not reading it first, am I? But... Firms will want the supplier power. Um, I'm just trying to think what, what perspective is it talking from this? This is the important thing, by the way, is to understand it from different perspectives. It's not just to see it from the business's perspective, but also see it from the consumer's perspective as well. So firms will want the supplier power to be uh, low, a firm, um, so that suppliers need to maintain lower prices improve customer service, credit terms, and generally work hard to keep the business as an owner. Remember, at this point, we're talking like, even though we're saying firms, we're talking about kind of business to business, can't we? If this was slightly different, if we were saying firms will want supplier power to them, they'll want, firms will want supplier power to be low, but in terms of this, if they themselves will want th them as suppliers, if that makes sense, they will want their power to be high. Does that make sense? So they want their, their suppliers, uh, the people who they're buying from, they want their supplier power to be low. They want the firm who are buying the supplies, they want their buyer power to be high. Okay, but if they're supplying themselves, they're, they're, sorry, they are supplying to a, a third party, then they want their supplier power to be high and the party who's buying from them, the buyer power to be low. Uh, I know it's complicated with all these, but hopefully that makes sense. Um... Supplier power means prices, uh, sorry, su lower su supplier prices means lower prices for the firm, which can either mean that they make more profit or are able to lower their own prices um, for the and increase the profit margin for the goods and services if they, if they do. Thus, the levels, um, thus the lower the buyer power, the more likely the levels of profitability. So, you know, supplier power in this regard is better for you. Um as a, as a supplier. Uh, factors that determine the level of uh, supplier power are number of suppliers. Remember, so same like we've talked about, is there only one person doing it? Importance of volume to suppliers. Um, you know, can we just do one? Is Do people need loads of this stuff? Is there ability to just go without or that kind of stuff? And then your cost of ease of switching suppliers. Is it easy? Um, to go to another supplier or something like that and and in the and in the past it was more difficult to say change energy suppliers but now it's a lot easier because um you know the companies will physically do it for you you know there are companies those those look after my bills and uh you know that money saving experts energy club and things like that so th there are companies who are out there some some really good companies who will just do it for you which is which is great isn't it um, and finally, um, is it finally? No, two to go. 
uh, degree or level of competition this relates to the competitive nature of the industry for example there are lots of competitors or very few more importantly it considers the level of power or strength these competitors have in a market remember even if it's a really saturated market if it's monopolistic and there isn't really a a, a top dog you know there is lots of branded image uh, lands of products but there's not that much power in any everyone's got quite equal uh, market share and things like that then it, maybe the, maybe it's not that much of a problem you know you could you could slip in and, and become one of these people it'd be more difficult to become dominant over a market like that because if it was that simple someone else would have done it but it's potential isn't it um it says uh, links can be made to market structures like we talked about monopoly oligopoly monopolistic competition perfect competition if you remember about perfect competition that's the one with no barriers to entry at all um and it fits in really well with market structures actually when you start talking about this because you think about well is it high levels uh, high barriers to entry if you've got a, a monopoly or an oligopoly yes they are going to have high barriers to entry and the, the they go lower the more product you know the more companies that are into that um, industry and things like that because all the way over to perfect competition um Firms will want the level of competition to be low because this will mean that they'll have more power within the market. Therefore, they'll have more flexibility in terms of the price they can charge. They'll require less promotion and generally have to work less to keep um, or gain customers. The lower the degree or level of competition, the higher the likely levels of profitability. So you can control your market more effectively, can't you? Um, factors impacting the level of competition, the level of collusion. Uh, remember, this is... Um, something you remember we talked about price setting ages ago price setting is, is illegal in the uk remember we, that's why we have rrps recommended retail prices because you're not allowed to tell um a company what to sell your product for you can imply it but there are ways around that sometimes there is collusion going on between companies and there is um i think there was one done a while ago by penguin books if i remember rightly and uh, penguin apple and someone else was involved with it. Big, big uh, suppliers of uh, e-books. And what they were doing was they were price setting. There was colluding in, collusion in that market because all the, the major um, book companies got together and said, well, you know what? We don't want to be giving e-books out at a uh, reduced price. Because, I mean, really, if you get an e-book, it should be you know quite a lot cheaper shouldn't it because they're not having to pay for distribution they're not having to pay for binding they're not having to pay for the physical printing or anything like that but they're not they're, they're widely quite a lot you know the same expense why is that because all the they've realized that um all the companies have decided together that they would only be putting ebooks out at that price and that they wouldn't compete with each other that's a problem that needs to be sorted out doesn't it so you can get these kind of like um uh, cartel kind of, of things where you um you know where, where they've controlled that market i know when you read the word cartel you might think of drug cartel a, dr a cartel is just like a group of companies that control the market uh, that's what a drug cartel is a drug cartel is where a group of drug dealers essentially or small companies in that regard control that drug drug trade in that thing that's why we hear about drug cartels it's just groups of people who control the drug trade but in this case it's it's groups of companies who control that market um maturity of the market so how well established is it is that is it, is it in decline itself what kind of uh you know life part of the life cycle is it in um strength of the brand as well in the individual brand um or other people's brand obviously that's going to affect it isn't it if you're going up against someone like mcdonald's or nike or apple it's gonna be a hell of a lot harder than if you're going up against some you know tiny company that you've never heard of Je jeff's uh you know hair salon um, last one, substitutes. Um, this relates on to how easily the customers can switch to alternative products or substitutes. Firms will want them to be um, low amounts of substitutes or less substitutes so that they do not need to compete as much as in terms of reducing prices, increasing promotion. The more substitutes there are, the firm's goods... Um, the more they'll have to work to convince customers to do it. Firms spend a lot of money on branding, which is essentially trying to reduce the number of acceptable alternatives, essentially. Um, example, Nike use branding to convince customers that whilst other trainers are available, none are as good and therefore can substitute Nike trainers. Uh, Apple do it with their ecosystem, don't they? Um, where if, if you get one product, it works really well with the other ones and things like that. And yes, you can get Android and things like that, but it doesn't work as well as the app Apple stuff with Apple stuff. Um so, you know, uh, Google have never really got that down as well as Apple have. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, getting someone to buy into an ecosystem with lots of products. That's a brilliant way of reducing substitutes in the market. Because although there are a lot of substitutes for, for MacBooks, a lot of people say, yeah, but it's not a MacBook, is it? It's not an iPhone. Yeah, you can buy a smartphone, but it's not an iPhone because the iPhone is by Apple. And for some reason, that, that 
um, seal of quality, that customer service, that the um, sort of uh, brand awareness and things and the way it makes you feel as a consumer is worth a lot to, of money to people. So that's fine, isn't it? That that reduces the um, buyer power in that market significantly. It increases the supplier power significantly, doesn't it? Because you can't go anywhere else. They've got a very unique product, the iPhone. Even calling it the iPhone is clever, isn't it? It's not a smartphone. It's an iPhone. It's, it's, it's a different product. Um, price and availability of substitutes as well so can you just go over is it more expensive is it cheaper and and the implications of those prices as well that it will make on the on the consumer um okay now in terms of this um yeah the, the, there is a question i haven't got a question to, to 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 hand for you i will just have a quick look just to see if i can grab one for you uh blah, 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 blah. whoops um Let's have a look. Now we'll see if I can get you one because I know you all love a past paper question. Um, four plus five forces. Here we are. Okay. Um. Let's have a look at this. I'll show you an answer. Oh, sorry, I'll show you a question and we'll have a look at it quickly. Okay. Um, let's have a look at this one. Okay. Okay, so we've got a question here. It says, uh, past paper question. Uh, over the last few years, British consumers have developed a taste for pizza. Two uh, between 2006 and 2011, the pizza U UK pizza industry um, grew by 13%, and between 2011 and 2016, it increased a further 22%. The total market is now worth around $1.85 billion. The graph shows the percentage of pizza outlets in the UK in 2016 owned by different businesses. Domino's Pizza now has over a quarter of the total number of outlets. Let me show you that. And it does have that. Okay, um, so we've got Ask, uh, Ask Italian, Zizi, um, Papa John's, Prezzo, Pizza Express, others, Pizza Hut, and Domino's Pizza. So you can see that Pizza Hut, Domino's Pizza dominance is quite significant, isn't it? Um, okay, there we go. And it says, okay, so it says outline Porter's five forces framework. So all you'd need to do with that an outline question um, is you're simply just explaining what it is. Okay, so just go through the five. You've only got three marks, so just go through the five forces um, really, really quickly. Um, and, and just a basic explanation of what they are. And then and then the second one, which is a 12 marker, he says, with the use of Porter's five forces framework, analyze and evaluate the position of Domino's Pizza. Okay, so all you would need to do for that, for a 12 marker... Um, uh, so it's um analyze and evaluate question. So we've got AO1, AO2, AO3, AO4 because we've got the Domino's Pizza thing as well in, in with this one, haven't we? Um, so that's you know potentially four marks for each of the AOs, but you know there's going to be some some little ones, you know maybe slightly more AO4, whatever it is. But even if we take it as you know three, 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 and it gives you your twelve marks. Um, with this one, all you'd need to do for that is just break it down. First of all, tell me what the um. Tell me what that, uh, what the five forces is. Okay, so just a quick explanation of the five different aspects, barriers to entry, you know, substitutes, that kind of thing. Um, and then basically just a paragraph for each one. So just five small paragraphs for that one. That's what I'd do. Um, just literally saying what whether they've got high buyer power, they've got low buyer power, whether they've got high um, supplier power, low supplier power, uh, whether there's many substitutes, whether there's not, whether there's big barriers to entry or not. Uh, you know, like, and I literally just go through and just bit by bit, uh, just tell me what it is. So this would be a fantastic one to try. If you want to have a go at it, this is a really good one to do because it's quite easy. Um, it's not a particularly difficult one. It's a 12 marker. You know, it's a really good brand, but a question this. And hopefully it'll draw your attention to uh, how useful and quite easy Porter's Five Forces are. So a really, really good one to have in your sort of bank of things to to remember for your um, for your exam. Um, just just having these as a, as a staple, uh, you know, theory to go to. 
to think about you know it but remember it's to do with the attractiveness of new markets essentially because of the you know the various forces that impact on them and, and the likelihood of success of you in that market okay so i hope that's helped let's have a quick look at the news okay uh, let's have a quick look at what's going on in the news and then we will call it for today so we've got retail sales crash in April as lockdown hits shops. We already know this, don't we? British clothing sales plummeted by 52, 50.2% last month as, as many high street clothes, uh, things are short. Poor, uh, mortgage payment holiday extended for three months. The treasury cautions at borrowers. Uh, it says homeowners struggling financially due to the coronavirus will be able to extend their mortgage payments holiday for a further three months or cut payments. Mortgage holidays started in March with allowed people to defer payments without affecting their credit rating. Uh, that despite respite for payments uh, at the end of the first applicants in June and the Treasury said that the extension will provide certainty for those affected. However, it said borrowers should still pay their mortgages if they were able to. Um, is that the kind of thing of... Uh, that's a weird one, isn't it? Because simultaneously the government is saying, "Oh, you should do this if you can," but that, but when when they talk about going to work, it seems quite extreme. When they talk about uh, this one, it's kind of implied that you don't really have to. Um, however, the treasury was concerned an abrupt end to the scheme could produce a cliff edge like effect, um, with families facing money problems as bad or if not worse as if they did when the virus struck. Um, Christopher. W Woolard, interim chief executive at the Financial Regulator of Financial Conduct Authority, said that it was customers could afford to restart mortgage payments if it was in the best interest to do so. But when they can't, a range of other further support will be available. This is what we've been talking about. Do you remember when I said that uh, people were just living on the bread, uh, you know, the bread line, and, and anything would 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 tip them over? I know this this is an extreme circumstance, and people who weren't on the bread line will be affected by this. But it's those people now. Um, it's going to be massively affected, isn't it? Um, hey, I don't know about this one. It says Brazil hits 20,000 deaths as a virus spreads in region. Sounds like they're going now. Brazil is is, um, is a difficult one to, to police, really, isn't it? Um, anyway, let's have a look at some business news. Oh, that was that the business news? <laughs> How will we pay for the coronavirus damage? austerity take take money off people who can't afford it that's how we'll do it I'll tell you that for free um amazon trials online food delivery in india it's a big one massive market imagine that imagine that if we talk about five forces fantastic opportunity for uh, amazon in that market in in india i don't know about the you know the ability to get alternatives in india because obviously i don't know that much more about that market but fantastic india is definitely a, an emerging market and definitely going to be a superpower you know china and india they're going to be they are already really dominant you know especially in manufacturing and stuff like that but they're becoming very very powerful dangerously powerful to be honest and they say africa is the last untapped resource don't they of exploitable labor um africa is still yet to be really you know taken advantage of by western uh, you know uh, countries and things like that like we have done with uh, with india and um, thinking but the the other argument for, from a business's perspective is why shouldn't we exploit indians uh, in india why shouldn't we exploit africans in africa why shouldn't we exploit um chinese people in china and and the it's it's a difficult one because the 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 business argument is the 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 fair game you know like that's and 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 from the business's perspective they argue that they're actually doing them a favor because they actually help them out of you know becoming a third world country or you know something like that um and it's a difficult one because when we say exploit it implies that you're doing something really negative when it, it, a lot of the time it's not that it's exploiting a resource it's using a resource isn't it so if you want to i mean ethically i think it's a it's a bad thing i think we should be playing them um reasonable rates of pay shouldn't we you shouldn't be exploiting people and you know uh, having slave labor in foreign countries and stuff like that no one should be endorsing that um but it'd be interesting to see um how much we would actually be able to uh, live our lives um at the state we are especially in western countries um to be able to afford things if we didn't have essentially slave labor in foreign countries um, and that's the horrible thing because when you buy things from places like primark and stuff like that and clothes clothes aren't supposed to be that cheap 
Um, it's only because you've got people working for pittances in foreign countries. Um, you wouldn't be able to do that. If you wanted to go and get some quals made in the UK, you wouldn't ever be able to make them for that price or physically make them yourself for that price if you had the skills and ability to buy the fabric and stuff like that. So it's because of massive economies of scale and stuff like that that we're able to exploit foreign workers. But you think... You know, when you're on the up and up, you know, you could kind of justify, oh, yeah, well, blah, blah, blah. And how many people are going to go to, to other places, even places, you know, even uh, now that you know, you know, now that we're aware of that, do people, do people care that much? I don't know. It's a difficult one, that one, isn't it? Um, It says universities fear falling lucrative overseas students. Hex plans to weather hard times. Heck, is that the heck as in the sausage company? Sausage maker Heck Foods was set up seven years ago. It now has a 60% share of the UK market. Wow, I didn't realise that. But its co-founder, Andrew Keeble, predicts hard times ahead with rising wage bills and tax bills. He says that the company's solution after a COVID-19 lockdown ends will be to big drive to automate production. So, <laughs> yeah, get some capital-intensive stuff, stop people being involved in the production line. Um, I keep seeing this lady everywhere. Who Who is this lady? I keep seeing this lady everywhere. She seems to be on lots and lots of, uh, of fashion stuff at the minute. Plus size fashion level, dear cut curves. Right, okay. I've not heard of them. But uh, founded in London in 2013, it has four staff and ships to 45 countries. But she seems to be on a lot of things at the minute. Um, you know, in terms about successful entrepreneurs and stuff. See, this is the reality of it, isn't it? The hope is that they're going to be able to survive long enough to be able to, to get out of it, aren't they? And hopefully they will be able to, to bounce back. Let's do one last one. Um, flexible working will be a new normal after virus. Yeah, I think that's true. Network, uh, Facebook. What he, he look? He's looking weirder and weirder. This guy, isn't he? Um, <laughs> you know, from Facebook. <laughs> look at the state. He looks like an alien. He's he's not. He's not, he's not making himself. Everybody says on the internet, isn't he? he looks like an alien. Well, he, he's not making himself look better, is he? Um, global car industry. Interesting. We were literally just talking about this, weren't we? It says World Bank wants sixty million at the at uh, the risk of extreme poverty. Um, David Malpas said that the bank expects global economic growth to shrink by five percent this year as nations deal with the pandemic. This has already led to millions losing their jobs and businesses failing, with poorer countries feeling the brunt. Uh, millions of livelihoods have been destroyed and healthcare systems are under strain worldwide. Our estimate is that 60 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty. That eases all the progress made. Um, that erases all the progress that's made in poverty alleviation in the past three years. Um, the World Bank defines extreme poverty as living on less than one pound fifty-five per person per day. Wow, think of that. And that's the point. This is what I'm. This is what I'm talking about. This is this is our. This is what we've been doing. And as I said, and, and we've got to be. We've got to take responsibility for it because um we're the buyers we have the power you know we talked about buyer power but that's what it is isn't it if we decided we weren't willing to allow people to be exploited in foreign countries and things like that but the question is are do people care that much or do they simply want what they want and i think a lot of the time they want what they want aren't they you know are you really going to go without so that someone in a foreign country can be better um or or to to earn a little bit more but it's crazy in these day and age isn't it i mean think of this we're so privileged in the uk to have a decent health service um and to be able to not you know i know a lot of people have died and but that's probably more to do with silly political decisions than it is anything else you know being slow to react and things like that um but uh, you know we don't have to worry about not being able to pay for a hospital but there are lots of countries lots of people in countries that do have to worry about that don't they imagine not being able to afford to go to hospital and stuff like that and I don't know. Maybe we need to start thinking more about that and start, um, you know, voting with our wallets a little bit more and going with the, you know, more well sustainable uh, and and 
you know, companies that are, uh, are playing fair with people. I think that's more of a sensible thing to do. Anyway, I hope you have a beautiful weekend. Uh, please keep safe. Please don't do anything stupid. Remember, um, it is not a joke. Um, and uh, I will see you all next week for another wonderful thing.